Hello, I'm Bishop Lutilka of the Catholic Diocese of Peoria. Over numerous conversations with our priests and lay leaders, we discerned five foundations on which we look to build the future of our church, to be a much more vibrant, mission-driven, sustainable church of the future. The five foundations are evangelization, discipleship, the centering our lives on the Eucharist, vocations, and the legacy of Archbishop Fulton Sheen. I welcome you to this conversation that I'm about to have with Father Adam Cesarek, the pastor of St. Mary's in Pontiac, over the topic of evangelization. It is an opportunity for all of us to simply reflect upon our calling to serve the church in the world today. Father Cesarek, welcome. It's good to be with you today to have this conversation about evangelization. Yeah, thanks for having me and thanks for asking me to do this. Excited to talk about it and be here with you to hear your vision a little bit about that. So maybe that's a good place to start is, yeah, tell, tell me a little bit about what you think when you think evangelization, what that looks like from your perspective and where we go from there. Sure. You know, evangelization is uh, sometimes a scary word for people, uh, but it's quite simply sharing our faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, we've all been touched by the Lord in a very powerful way, a transformative way. Uh, Jesus has captured our hearts. And that's what evangelization is all about, is capturing the hearts uh, for Jesus of those that we encounter. And so evangelization is, in a sense, the church's fancy word to say that we are supposed to share our own experience of how Jesus has entered into our lives, uh, and then to share that experience, inviting others to have that same type of encounter in their own life. Uh, it's part of who we are as his disciples, uh, but it's really that opportunity to be able to say, you know, I have experienced Jesus's love in such a powerful way, mm. and it's made all the difference in my life. Wow. And, and really, I think that's, that's it, right? Like it's falling in love with Jesus, which changes everything, and exactly. then in turn, can't help but wanna share it. <laughs> and that's really, yeah, profound, thanks, yeah. yeah. So when we think about evangelization, we often, uh, I think, uh, again, when we hear that word, we, we tend to think, well, programs, what programs do we have to do or what training do I need? Uh, in your own experience, uh, how have you felt that you have been an evangelizer? Sure. I would, you know, in my own experience, real quick, go back to when I was a child, I was really excited about my faith as a little boy. And I think everybody has that some experience of that when they first encounter the faith, they're excited about it. I see it in our kids at our school. I was there and then you get to that junior high phase <laughs> and when you get to junior high you start worrying about what everybody else is thinking about you right. you know here we are in this time in particular close to all saints day halloween in this time where we are we tend to put on masks right and you kind of be what you think the people around you want to be and when I was in junior high, pretty unpopular in, in junior high. I don't know that anybody's super cool in junior high, but... Um, Everybody's awkward in junior <laughs> exactly. high. Exactly. So I, and that's where I was. And I started putting that away a little bit in that time. I, did, I thought maybe my awkwardness comes from my excitement about Jesus. So I, I kind of slowed that down. I honed it in. Still did the things I was supposed to do, but it was probably... By the time I got to college, when I really had a deep encounter with Jesus Christ, so in those years from junior high to college, it's kind of going status quo, being what I thought everybody wanted me to be or what I should be. But college, something started to happen there, and I, I encountered Jesus in a way I didn't know through the other people around me who were evangelizing me. Actually, I always say, I always like to think that we tend to evangelize like we were evangelized. Sure. And the man who evangelized me, he was a focused missionary on my campus and he was relentless in his pursuit of me. He just would come into my room as he was playing video games with friends or whatever. I was like, are you a college student? I didn't know what a focused missionary was, you know? And he's like, nope, just kind of here on campus, just graduated and called to kind of help young people get to know Jesus. So he came and he did all that and he just was just constantly there. He was never pushy about it. He just was there in my life, you know, that walking with me, being there present with me, uh, keep encouraging me like, hey, come to Bible study, come to Bible study. And I still had that mindset from my junior high, like, well, if I go to a Bible study, will I end up going back to the reputation I had in junior high, you know? And But he just kept inviting me at the spot where I was. And, and really, I, he probably invited me 25 times to his Bible study before I came. 
And it was finally in that Bible study where a group of 13, 14 guys, we started talking about how to live our lives with Jesus at the center of it, how to treat our girlfriends at that time, uh, how to be on the sports field. There was a number of athletes in that Bible study, how to act with your friends on the weekends. And we held each other accountable to that and we did it with Jesus at the center. It was probably that time that started to form me in my walk with Jesus to see like, oh, I can actually live my faith and share my faith and it doesn't have to be scary or weird, you mm -hmm. know? And sure. so it was those folks that really helped me, especially that missionary and those guys in that Bible study that led me down the path to want to evangelize because they evangelized me. Thanks for sharing that story because I think there's a lot of elements in your story that is uh, helpful to us when we think about evangelization. Uh, one, and first and probably foremost is the fact that we put Jesus at the center of our lives. Mm -hmm. And so we have experienced Jesus in a very powerful way. And we, we kind of want to say, I want to keep Jesus there. Mm -hmm. I want my life to be centered on him. Uh, I want to learn about him, uh, but more so I want to learn how my life can imitate him sure. and, and, and what he means to me, how, how that love that he has given to me uh, has transformed me and shaped me. Uh, I think another important element of evangelization that you talked about in that, that experience is that it's about invitation and accompaniment. Mm -hmm. It's not being pushy. Uh, it's not saying you have to do this or you should do this. It's, it's really about inviting you into a possible experience. Uh, so the man who was uh, persistent uh, with you is, is, is the example of saying, hey, I've experienced this. I just want you to share it. It was so good for me and it could be so good for you. Absolutely. And so that's why he was persistent, is, is, is his life had been changed by his encounter with Jesus. And so he wants to share that, and he wants to create that opportunity for you. A another reality uh, of evangelization is to be able to see Jesus in one another, yeah. to see the, the people around us who, again, because the way they're living their life, having encountered the Lord in such a powerful way, uh, that that it becomes appealing and interesting for us to yeah. kind of look at that. Yeah. Uh, and then ultimately, I think the other piece that, that's really powerful in your story is the fact that, you know, a recognition that the Lord's ultimately going to do the work, right? Mm -hmm. We're just the instruments. Yep. Um, we're called to share what we have received. Uh, but in the end, how that happens in another person's life, we may never even know. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we simply are called to go out and and share that experience, uh, invite those encounters and accompany those who want to walk on that journey. Uh, but they have to have the experience for themselves. That's right. uh, we can't force it. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Lord and the Holy Spirit are going to kind of keep working at it. Yeah. It's funny what you were saying there when I was thinking the young man who drew me to the faith, his name was John. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember early on, he was that and he was the means of the encounter that I had with Jesus. He, he, he helped draw me to him. And I remember the time the bracelets were the WWJD oh, yeah, yeah. bracelets. And I would, at that time, I was like, yes, what would Jesus do? But I needed a concrete example of that as well. In some way, like I know Jesus in some way, but I remember even saying it, and he was very humbled by this. Like, don't say that. It's like, like why we, my mindset was, what would John do? You know, like, what would John do? Like, would John, if, because John knew Jesus and I knew that. And I needed that little concrete understanding of what does that look like in the world? And, and he was a great example of that to me. The beauty was is his story. I, this is one of my favorite things about evangelization and, and discipleship as well. He, he encountered Jesus Christ through another young man on his campus when he was a student in college as well, who showed him what it was like, there's Jesus, you know, like, can I walk with you towards him, you know, together? And he did the same thing with me and please God, you know, I've been able to do that with a handful of people myself. And now the, maybe the most fun part of evangelization is when God wins the heart of a person that he calls you to walk with for a while sure. and then you see them going and doing it. Sure. There's nothing more exciting than that. And it's like, wow, the Lord, I think this is what it's all about. And it's what you talk about disciple making right there. That's it starts with evangelization. Yeah. And um, so kind of cool stuff. Well, having that that encounter is just so freeing to us mm -hmm. um, because we often are looking at the world in the way that the world uh, judges things. I mean, you talked about the awkwardness of being a, a junior high student, which 
we're all awkward in junior high. Uh, but you know, it, we're concerned about what does the world think? Uh, what are people going to uh, say about me if I really live out my faith? And yet, um, when we allow Jesus to really transform our hearts, yeah. um, when we encounter Jesus as the person, right? Not just the idea, yeah. uh, not just to, to learn about facts or, or ideas about who Jesus was, but to really encounter Jesus in our life, um, you, you end up being freed because you're like, I don't care what the world says, right? Mm -hmm. I know that what's yeah. most important is that Jesus loves me, mm -hmm. accepts me for who I am. Yep. And Jesus walks with me. You know, I mean, that's one of one of my favorite stories of all all of Scripture. Of course, is the journey to Emmaus. You know, mm -hmm. the disciples are walking together because we need each other to help yeah. support one another. Yeah. And Jesus comes and walks with them, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and that's that's really the uh, idea of evangelization is walking with others mm -hmm. and allowing the Lord to come into that that sure. experience. Um, and then we're able to really look at those people, right? Because mm -hmm. we might look at somebody and say, well. You know, oh, that's a holy roller, or that you know, they're they're too pious, or I can yep. never, I can never be a saint, right? And, yep. and that, and yet, when we stop to think about how the Lord impacts us, mm -hmm. and and Jesus walking with us, and you know, uh, accompanying us on our journey, yep. uh, which is unique to us, mm -hmm. uh, that's lived out in the midst of the church, uh, all of a sudden, uh, that that realization is, it's it, we we can point to those people and say, you know, for you, this John was a person who lived his faith, yep. you know, and we can look into our own lives, whether it's in our families, the, the church community that we uh, grew up in or were a part of or are a part of now. Yep. Uh, and we can look at those people and we can say, oh, they're authentic yep. yeah, that's in that relationship. Mm -hmm. They really know that Jesus is, is with them in their life. And it makes all the difference for them and for us. For sure. Because it's so attractive then as our, our life. You, when you were speaking there, it drew to mind something. I, I don't know, I was, when I was a missionary, a lot of my evangelization experience comes from being a focused missionary and doing that, encountering it through other missionaries and then going and doing it on my own at some point. And I remember Curtis Martin, when he was teaching us all about all of these different things, one of the stories he always shared, which hit at one of the points you were hit thinking about, he always talks about this teacher, I don't know, we'll call her Mrs. McGillicuddy, that's at the front of a classroom and the class just is not paying attention, right? Like they're just having a rough day. And, uh, and she's kind of frustrated and overwhelmed. And she says, because someone in this class tell me the difference between ignorance and apathy, right? And, uh, and, and no one's paying any attention to anything she says in the moment. And finally, she goes to the star student in the classroom, we'll call her Susie, whoever, and Susie's there, and Susie's not paying attention either. And she says, Susie, tell me the difference between ignorance and apathy. And she's like, what? You know? And Susie's having a rough day too. And Susie's like, she's like, tell me the difference between ignorance and apathy. And she looks at her like, I don't know, and I don't care, you know, with that, you know, like, but that's it, right? We have to address, I think, in evangelization, as mm -hmm. Curtis says, like those two problems, the I don't know problem, like, yes, that's an important problem. Mm -hmm. But if you address the I don't know problem, which is what we do with catechesis, right? Mm -hmm. That catechesis is teaching people about the things that we believe, what we right. believe as Catholics. However, if we start there, we miss something really right. important, which is the I don't care problem. Right. And if there, there are so many people that just don't know who Jesus Christ is here, they might have I, so many of my friends I went to a Catholic high school. I don't know, a handful of us still go to mass on Sunday, but what happened there? They knew a whole lot of information about Jesus. You could quiz them about Jesus. Sure. You could give them all kinds of questions about Jesus. But one thing that we missed, I think, and so many of my classmates, some of, you know, some of us encountered that, thanks be to God, others just missed this. That, that I don't care, like they never fell in love with the person of Jesus. Right. They knew a whole lot of stats, a whole lot of information. Mm -hmm. Be like, you know, your husband or wife or whatever it is, like, oh, you know, the, my wife is five, seven, has blue eyes and brown hair. Like that's a whole lot of stats and information right. about the right. wife. But to be able to say, why do you love your wife? You know, like if a husband couldn't answer that question, he's going to probably be sleeping on the couch, you know? <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and, um, and the thing is for us too, is, is, is human beings trying to follow Christ. He should set my heart on fire right. with love of him. And if 
I might know a lot about him, and I think I did. I, when I got to college, I knew a whole lot about Jesus. I could have told you a lot of facts. I could have told you a lot of Bible stories. Could have done a lot of that. It was when I started to encounter him in prayer, and, and I think that's maybe where the key starts. Like evangelization has to start with an intimate encounter with Jesus. Sure. You, we can't evangelize till we start there. Exactly. And I don't know, I'd be interested, your take on on that part of it, you know, like like evangelization has to start with intimacy with Jesus. How does that work for you and your relationship of walking with him and him like like talking to you in whatever way he speaks to you? And I need you to go do this because you don't become a bishop without <laughs> without that happening, right? Um, you don't become a priest, so you don't become a lay person on fire with the faith until an encounter with Jesus happens. I don't know, what what did that kind of look like for you when you started like, this prayer is changing me, right? This prayer is doing something. I don't know, what did that look like? I, I agree with you, prayer is so essential mm -hmm. to uh, our, our encounter with Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, I, I love what you're talking about, the I don't know and I don't care. And perhaps another way to say it is, is the paradigm that we often have used is to, uh, behave, believe, and then belong, yeah, you know, yeah. and, and that's mm -hmm. really been a paradigm that we've operated out of uh, that needs to be reversed mm -hmm. because we have to uh, belong, mm -hmm. believe, and then behave, right? Yeah, you know, we, yeah. we belong first because Jesus loves us first, Amen. you know, and so that experience, that encounter, uh, which then leads us to believing, uh, learning about him, because mm -hmm. there's a big difference between catechesis and evangelization. And I think they often get very um, confused mm -hmm. uh, or, or uh, we think that it's interchangeable. Yeah. Catechesis is an element of evangelization, but we got to capture our heart before we capture our mind, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, we have to, you know, uh, belong first, know we're loved. Uh, then we want to learn more about this Jesus who loves us mm -hmm. unconditionally. Uh, that leads us into our belief and understanding of him. And that ultimately leads us into then the behavior that we live as his disciple. Uh, but it, it does start with that sense of prayer uh, and, and finding the Lord, uh, you know, for ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, I heard a story once about, uh, I think it was a Jesuit priest. Every morning uh, when he had his cup of coffee at his uh, little kitchen table, mm -hmm. uh, he always had his cup of coffee and he had a cup of coffee for the empty seat, and that was for Jesus to sit down and drink mm. the coffee, you know, uh, and it was just a visual for him to recognize that when he sat down to pray each day, uh, that he was not just praying to some idea out in sure. the universe, but he was praying to the person he wanted to have the conversation with, which yeah. was Jesus, you know, and so prayer is that time that we take to sit down and to open ourselves up and to listen to the Lord. I think one of our challenges in the world today is to help people understand and learn how to pray. Mm. Um, and we often, you know, thankfully we have rote prayers that we, we say, uh, you know, we could pray the rosary and get lost in reflecting upon the mysteries of the rosary and that, but you know, for the encounter to happen, it's to move beyond just the words, yeah. uh, to move into the silence, which can be very uncomfortable for us. There's a lot of noise in our world yeah. and in our lives. Um, and to move into the fact that, yeah, I'm talking to a person, mm -hmm. you know, Jesus is my friend. Jesus is, you know, the one who wants to show me love, uh, both in the sense of affirming and encouraging, but also challenging, right? Yeah. You know, calling me to be more than I am. Mm -hmm. um, and so to take that time uh, for prayer and, and to really be able to then, uh, as we make that space in our lives uh, for, for the Lord, um, to then to be able to discern what it is. How do we hear the voice of God? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, when I sit down to pray, um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, initial like, here's my agenda type things, <laughs> sure. you know, yeah, uh, and, <laughs> and not just, not just like my agenda as, well, this is what I want you to talk about with you, Lord, but even just my, you know, here's the agenda as far as, boy, these are the things I'm dealing with, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and it's almost like for me, at least I, I spend the first probably five, 10 minutes, uh, in prayer kind of telling Jesus, this is what I, I want to deal with. Mm -hmm. And then I spend the next 20 minutes just kind of listening. Yep. 
Um, I like, I call that the stop sweating, you know, yeah. like, like I just got to take a break and stop sweating for a second and exactly. then you can get into it, get it all out. So you yep. can really focus. Yeah. You know, uh, if I've, if I put everything out on the table now, mm-hmm. I have got nothing in the way for you to kind of fill that space. Right. And, yep. and the amazing thing is, is some of those, sometimes, you know, you hear that inner voice, mm-hmm. which is the voice of Jesus. Yep. Um, the idea comes to mind about one of those things that was on your agenda. <laughs> Uh, and so clarity comes about, yeah. or there's an invitation or thinking about, um, you know, I remember this experience that was similar, and mm-hmm. therefore now I'm thinking about those those people that were in the previous experience and how that comes into yep. the current experience and, and how does that then interact? Yeah. Um, because the voice of Jesus is heard in so many different ways, right? It's not just one way. Mm-hmm. We see Jesus in our life all around us. Um, and so it, whether it's, you know, sitting before the Blessed Sacrament in a holy hour, whether it's praying a rosary, whether it's uh, taking a walk in nature, um, whether it's in a conversation like this, yep. the, the, this is how the Lord is speaking and interacting with us. Um, and so being able to kind of maybe shift intentionally in our minds and our hearts to say, you know, it's not just Father Adam's voice I'm hearing. I'm hearing the voice of Jesus in this conversation. Uh, I'm hearing the voice of Jesus in this situation, or I'm seeing the presence of Jesus in this situation, which is a, a commitment on our part mm-hmm. uh, because we can get easily distracted. I can get easily distracted yeah. in all, all the things that the world is saying. But, you know, when I pull myself back and say, no, 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 I know God is in this moment, mm-hmm. right? I go back to the story of Emmaus, right? They start and they're talking and Jesus is walking with them. And they're the ones who are doing all the talking initially. (laughs) And they finally kind of quiet down and like, have you not heard what's gone on? And then Jesus starts to talk, Yeah. right? And then as Jesus talks with them, he helps them to see, he interprets everything that they have witnessed and he interprets everything from the scripture that has been proclaimed about who he is. Best Bible study ever, right? it, Exactly. <laughs> you know, and it leads them, of course, to the meal mm-hmm. where then they recognize him in the breaking of the bread, mm-hmm. in the Eucharist, yeah. you know? And, and uh, so... Where our heart's not on fire. Exactly. Where, you know, like there it is, right? Like that's the encounter right there that we're all looking for. <laughs> and, and then since our heart's on fire, what happens? They run to tell others, mm-hmm. right? And that's that's our call of discipleship. That's our call as evangelizers mm-hmm. is to run and tell others. Yep. I experience this powerful love mm-hmm. of Jesus in my heart. Uh, no matter what the situation, no matter how much I'm a sinner, mm-hmm. no matter whether I succeeded or failed, I experienced that Jesus was present to us. And we all have those moments yeah. Yeah. Uh, that ultimately then, again, ignite the fire Mm -hmm. uh, of the spirit and of Jesus' presence in our life that Mm -hmm. when that happens, it's like, I don't want to keep this for myself. Yeah, you know, you know, when you were speaking there, you were talking about how how those encounters happen. I've noticed in in my life, to some degree, you even already talked about it, but I think I want to, there's something there of when we, sometimes the way we're formed to pray, God's cha- asking, challenging us. One of those things that you said, he's comforting us, he's affirming us, but he's also challenging us. And when, one of the things he's challenged me on is to be open to new forms of yes. prayer, right? And because that, I don't know, I, I, I've seen this in my life, like three things, sometimes we end up in, whether it's in a relationship with another person or in relationship with God, it kind of ends up like we know a lot of things about each other, but like when people come to me for marriage counseling, the first line I hear more than anything else probably is, we seem to have fallen out of love with one another, you right. know? And and I think, I don't know, this is my take on this, but I think three things tend to go missing. We tend to lose it. Like think of when a new per like a couple meets each other for the first time, they can't wonder enough things about one another. They lose a right. sense of wonder, you know? Sure. Like, and I think that's the first thing you got to draw out in, the, in, in any relationship, especially with God. There's an infinite amount of things to wonder about sure. him, you know? Sure. Like, like look up at the sky, look at like right now, the beauty of the orange and the red and the color of the leaves when you just walk around and just imagining how he, he's caught up in the tiniest things, but the biggest things, you know, billions of light years away and then right in front of me wondering about that and spending time just sitting with that 
uh, and learning new things about God in that conversation sure. with him. And then that, that, and also having new experiences with him. Because I, I think sometimes we get caught up in this idea, like this is how I have to pray. Yeah. Like this is the yeah. only way to pray. I recently went to my spiritual director a while back. Uh, it's been a few months back. And I told him, I said, I, I love Mary and I love the rosary, but I am having a really hard time right now. I, I don't want to stop praying the rosary, but it's like a drudgery right now. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes it's just a reality. And, 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 but this is my conversation with Mary. I want to talk with her. I want to have mm -hmm. a conversation with her so that she can lead me closer to Jesus and the Father, you know? And so talking about that and thinking about that, and he, he just had a simple thought, you know? Like, do you think Mary wants you to be miserable with her in conversation? And I was like, no, I don't think Mary, like what mom wants to be in a miserable conversation with their child and, and sure. some, just this simple thing. I, I now have on my, in my chapel at my house, um, two children's books on Mary mm -hmm. and they're changing, like they're beautiful pictures and beautiful images of Mary. And I, I don't even look the day before. It's like, it's like a new adventure every day. I just turn the page like, oh, today's Our Lady Guadalupe. And the next day is Our Lady of Fatima. You know, like, I don't know what's coming. It's changing my encounter with Mary in a way that, like, being open to what God is calling you to. What's the Holy Spirit doing in you? Because prayer isn't supposed to be a drudgery. And right. I think if prayer is a drudgery for us, we're not going to be good evangelists. Like, right. like prayer is supposed to bring us alive to encounter the living God. And, and so for me to be open to new experiences in prayer, to wonder about God in new ways, to have new thoughts and have new experiences with Him in my prayer, mm -hmm. maybe today it is sitting with Him right before Him for an hour in the Blessed Sacrament and wondering about some of that. Maybe today it's that walk, looking at the beauty of the leaves that are changing on the trees and just talking with him in that conversation or the rosary or looking at a children's picture book about pictures of Mary. And that changes my encounter with him, which in turn is changing me mm -hmm. and hopefully allowing me to have a new experience to share with other people. And I think that's the crux of evangelization. If our prayer like seems heavy and difficult and like boring even like god doesn't want us to be bored mm -hmm. in conversation with right. him you know he wants us to be excited to be in conversation with him and to look forward to talking to him so i don't know that was just something that hit me um as you were speaking mm -hmm. evangelization has to start with that intimacy in the same way like in a husband wife relationship or a friendship when that relationship like you start seems like like it's becoming dull or boring, like, well, it's not because the relationship is boring. It means that something in it, like God's like calling me somewhere different right. in that relationship. doesn't mean I have to give up on that relationship, whether it's with him or with any person. Absolutely. It's just a new way of like, let's, let's enter into this with new wonder and a new lens. Yeah. Yeah. You, know, you know, when we have relationships are so important, obviously most mm -hmm. important relationship is our relationship with Jesus, our savior. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but it, it, when we look at our relationship, uh, with others, we're constantly kind of moving forward in it, right? You know, you get to know, like, maybe you do start with knowing some things about somebody, right? Mm -hmm. And that, yeah. but the curiosity is to know them more, mm -hmm. right? To go deeper, yep. you know, and to, to open ourselves up a little bit more. And you were talking about really being open, mm -hmm. uh, open in prayer to, in, in new ways of praying. Cause yeah. sometimes we hit deserts, right? Yep. You know, something Absolutely. works for us for a while and then all of a sudden it's not really working for us. <laughs> and how, it's not that we're gonna throw it out, but how are we gonna get back to where it's fruitful mm -hmm. uh, in, in taking and praying in that way. And, and the beauty of our churches is, is that we have so many different forms of prayer yep. that, that feed us in different ways and in different levels. Uh, that nurture that relationship, but it's that that the desire to go deeper with somebody and want the best for them, and that's mm -hmm. I think important in in our encounter with Jesus is knowing that He wants the best for us, yeah. right? Yeah. He's constantly looking to say that you know I, I love you and I I want to love you even more, mm -hmm. right? You know uh, if we can even kind of His love is infinite, <laughs> you know. But it, from our our understanding, you know, it's 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 almost like I, I want to encourage you. I want to deepen that relationship. I want the best for you. And so, here's a new opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. A new way of praying. Yep. You know, um, we start off quite honestly teaching those rote prayers. You know, yep. 
the Our Father, the Hail Mary, praying the Rosary, the Glory Be. I mean, we we learn because those are our anchors. Yep. You know, they they they're a, a security blanket. You could always fall back into those yep. those rope prayers, but really, ultimately, the Lord wants us to have that free conversation, right? Mm -hmm where again we can start that prayer with our agenda <laughs> or you know uh we can just find those experiences um where god speaks to us mm -hmm. you know where we become aware in the moment yep you know uh it's it's almost like you know the lord is always present to us mm -hmm. he's always walking with us yep. uh but our eyes are kept from seeing him and every once in a while we get that glimpse like Oh yeah, Jesus, you're here with me. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know, yep. sometimes that's really, really affirming, and sometimes a little worried because it's like I know I'm a sinner, and I don't know yeah, if I want Jesus with us. me when I'm sinning. You know, yep. but uh, you know, it, it it does humble us, and it does uh, remind us of His constant mm -hmm. presence, which is so important uh, in our lives. And it, and it just that sense of you know, use the example of of a husband and wife or mm -hmm. of good friends, you know, wanting the best for each other. Yep. And as you want the best for each other, you're trying to help th th that person mm -hmm. and yourself to grow. Sure. You know, uh, and so that encounter deepens mm -hmm. and, and and there's vulnerability there. Yep. Right. Uh, and I think for me, one of the most amazing things is, is that when when we are vulnerable mm -hmm. with Jesus, you know, the, I've never had an experience in my vulnerability with Jesus where I haven't felt his love, mm -hmm. you know, and I think we often tend to think like, you know, well, if if I am that honest and open and that vulnerable, he's not going to love me like, like I, I I'm not worthy of that mm -hmm. or I don't deserve that or my sin is too great, yeah. <laughs> you know, and and yet when I'm that open and that honest and that vulnerable, I've never had the experience where I haven't felt Jesus looks beyond all of that. Those things that I look to. Yep as being important because the only thing he looks to be important is that love. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you bring up that vulnerability because that's the key, right? Like if we can't be real in our conversation with Jesus, like he, he can, what can he do with it? We, like he can do anything. However, he wants us to come to him. You just think of story after story in the scripture, the people who come to Jesus mm -hmm. and are vulnerable and open to receive what, like Absolutely. they are, they leave completely different, you right. know, and the ones who come there hard hearted from the Pharisees or whoever it is, or, Mo, or uh, in the old Testament, Pharaoh, all those instances of a lack of vulnerability seem to be the very thing, the difference between someone who's set on fire for Jesus Christ mm -hmm. or the Lord in the Old Testament or the person who just like leaves and the, the rich young man who walks away, right? Like, right? There's a sadness there because when we truly get vulnerable with Jesus, he changes us, he transforms us. Um, we no longer are caught up in the ways of this world, right? And do not be conformed to this world, but renewed by the transformation of our minds. Mm -hmm. And that's that important thing, I think, that you bring up, that vulnerability. And by no means, like evangelization, catechesis, they're both incredibly, we want to know and love, right? That's what we are. That's our soul, our ability to know, our ability to love. They have to come together. And I, the, one of my examination of conscience is in my desire, like in my evangelization, like I'll occasionally at the end of the day, like, how did I do at evangelization today? You know, um, in a very real conversation with Jesus, I, I start analyzing the things that I love in this world, right? Like person I probably love most outside of Jesus himself, like probably mom, you know, like, you know, like mom's up there. I really love Chick-fil-A, right? Like I really love country music. I really love baseball, right? And so at the end of the day, I'll just ask myself, did I evangelize people more today to Chick-fil-A? Because I can make be a pretty good salesman for Chick-fil-A, you know, on an evangelization. Like, like, and if someone doesn't like Chick-fil-A, I kind of take that as like, well, what's, what happened? Like, clearly something went wrong, you know? Like, I kind of take it as a personal offense in some way. I'm like, oh, I got to sell it better, you know, like, in a way that they're going to be able to receive it. Well, did you try the Chick-fil-A sauce with the sandwich, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, or did you just have the sandwich? Because if you just had the sandwich, it's not the same. Right. Like, that same thing, like, d did I evangelize Jesus, as much as I evangelize country music or baseball or Chick-fil-A today, you know, did I, did I get as excited about talking? And if I didn't, that's a good examination for me. Like, 
oh man, Jesus, I was more excited about talking about the Cubs today than I was talking about you. Um, that's okay to be excited about the Cubs. However, I did it more than I did with you. And so that makes me immediately say like, mm -hmm. mm, I got to have a pretty serious conversation with Jesus here about, all right, something I need to talk to you about. Um, I'm missing some sort of love because if we are in love with somebody or something, you can't help but want to talk about it. Yeah. And you learn those new things about them. And then the catechesis starts to grow, like you said, right? There was a day in my life that I did not know that a Chick-fil-A chicken sandwich existed, right? <laughs> um, I had to know that the thing existed in order to know that I loved that thing, right? Mm -hmm. It's to see like the knowledge starts, but then they build off of there. Like, you know something, then you want to love it. A person, the same thing. How many husbands and wives? Like, I, I want to know, like he sees a beautiful girl over there. He's like, I want to know that girl better, right? And so he asks her for a date and then he gets to know her on a deeper level. And there's some little bit of love that starts to build there, you know? Right. And then that love makes him want to know her better, right? Like, and know more about her. This is how our faith mm -hmm. is supposed to build, but that evangelization is the crux to it, to say that falling in love process then makes me want to know more. And if that, that, that I always ask those couples in marriage preparation or marriage counseling, when you stop, like, when you fell out of love with one another, you said you fell out of love with one another, when did you stop learning new things about each other? And I think that's one of those keys to our walk with God. When we leave Catholic grade school or leave Catholic high school or leave a Catholic college, did we stop learning new things about Jesus? You know, like if we did and we're wondering why our relationship with him seems far, we just got to start learning some new things about him, so, you know, encountering him in new ways which leads us down that path towards being evangelized. And then we go and evangelize again. And that starts with what you said, vulnerability. We live in a world where uh, we have a, a challenge in, in any relationships, mm -hmm. right? We have a challenge in communicating. You know, how often is it, you know, we, we, we tend to pick on young people, but it's not just young people, but you, you, you're at a restaurant and you see, you know, five young people sitting at a table and they're all texting on their phones and not talking to each other, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's this whole desire and we need people. Mm -hmm. We need to have relationships. Uh, that's who we are created as relational beings. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it, you know, and, and so the reason this is so important to us is because the world has lost that sense of relationship mm -hmm. and being able to communicate with each other. And, you know, if we can't talk to one another, we're having a hard time talking about God yeah. and sharing that experience and that encounter. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so we have mm -hmm. kind of like this, you know, uh, misguided sense that, well, you know, it's just going to happen, right? Yeah. You know, um, it's just going to happen if, if, if uh, it, it, you know, uh, it, it, if somebody desires it, it's just going to, somehow it's going to magically mm -hmm take place you know the old uh you know uh, field of dreams if you build it they will come uh -huh. you know that's not true you know um and it's never been true mm. you know uh jesus from the start chose disciples <laughs> to work with him to walk with him to be sent on mission you know and and so from the start it's been about creating a relationship that then sends us out yep. You know, and uh, we we live in a world that's hungry yep. for connection. That's that's hungry for love. That's hungry for relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 the, the the strange thing is is as much as that that desire is there, we we we're not you know trying to find the answer. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're just like. You know, I'm, I'm hungry, but I don't know what I want to eat. <laughs> you know, and, and, and in every family. Always. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, but but the, the, the point is, is, is that, you know, why this is so important mm -hmm. is because we know what the answer is. Yeah. It's Jesus. Mm -hmm. Bringing Jesus to the center of our lives resolves, uh, feeds our hungers, resolves our problems. You know, gives us the direction, uh, invites us into community, right? Because again, Jesus didn't, you know, he didn't choose one disciple and yeah. say, it's you and I. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Jesus chose 12 disciples and he invited others into the mission. Mm -hmm. um, he, he, he showed us mm -hmm. that in our human nature, we need to be in relationship with one another which constantly means that we do have to go deeper. We have to learn to love one another. We have to have that desire to know new things about each other. Um, but it's not just about, again, it's to really know who somebody is, yeah. you know. Those, you're, you're bringing up some really important stuff in this realm, I think. And I think there's a lot of people that have, including myself, and even at times still, but very much so in my past, there's fears to go talk about this stuff, sure. right? Those fears that come up of like, well, what do I do? How do I do? You know, like, like, what, like, you know, we kind of feel like we need a master's degree in theology to talk about this. Like, and we, you know, like it's, it's about the, the encounter. It's about that experience. I don't know. I, I what, what are, I, I can think of some of those fears like that I've had in my own life of fears of like why, why I was afraid to evangelize or why I was afraid to talk about that. Um, I think maybe that's good to talk about a little bit. Like how do we help, um, how have we, how has God helped us and that fear in ourselves? It still happens at me at times like, ah, like, should I do this right now? Um, even getting on an airplane, like, it's like, man, sometimes it'd just be nice to put on some sweats and sit on the airplane, you know, but when you wear the clerics to the airplane, sure. you know that there's going to be encounters. And so even for me to like, I oh, just like wear the clerics because it will create a conversation with someone next to me just by the fact that I wear it, you know? Um, and I think sometimes it doesn't have to be overwhelming. It's just talking with our people in the parish this weekend a little bit about this in the homily, like evangelization doesn't have to be that scary. Right. It could be as simple like, hey, like, what's the, what's going to happen on Monday morning? Monday morning, you're likely going to go to work. And when you get to work, someone is going to ask you, what did you do this weekend, right? Someone's going to ask you that sure. question. And we're going to, we typically do the typical answers. Well, not too much. We just hung around as a family or whatever it was like, or I didn't, really didn't do too much at all or whatever. Or maybe we did do something exciting, but like that we would always be intentional about something. Like it's not hard, right? Like it, this is simple as like, what did you do this week? And you know what I did? I went to mass with my family, you know, yep. that right. Th that's evangelism. Like, oh, we, oh, like yeah. that's not hard to say. Like, what did yeah. you do this weekend? I went to mass with my family mm -hmm. and that what's that going to do? That person's going to be like, wow, like I didn't go to whether Catholic or not Catholic, I didn't go to church with my family. That's going to simply enough, they might bite on that and want more information. Sure. Like, wow, really? You go to church? Like something comes from that or they sure. might not. But what's happening is that was a moment of evangelization. As simple as saying, like, instead of saying, I didn't do anything this weekend, mm -hmm. I went to mass with my family this weekend. What a power, like that's an evangelization moment. You it's, know? And that's a great example because, <laughs> um, you know, shouldn't that be our answer to that question every Monday morning, <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, yep. I went to mass with my family, you mm -hmm. know, um, it, because those are the moments Mm -hmm. that people remember yeah. uh those are the 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 that's the witness mm -hmm. you know evangelization another way to talk about evangelization is giving witness yep. to who jesus is and who i am because of my relationship with jesus mm -hmm. and so you know i i think you mentioned fears you know our fear is is that i'm going to be rejected i'm going to get labeled i'm going to get put in the box you know uh, I'm going to be judged because I'm willing to talk about my relationship mm -hmm. with Jesus or to talk about the fact that I go to church, yeah. you know, and we have to set aside those fears, right? We have, we have great power to overcome fear, mm -hmm. especially through the grace of the Holy spirit in our life yeah. and that. And so, you know, if we're able to kind of set aside those things and do those most basic, simple kind of witnessing mm -hmm. that, invites other it plants the seed yeah. uh it, it gives that other person an opportunity to think about what they did yep. or who they are mm -hmm. you know whether it's you know answering the monday morning question well what did you do this weekend i went to mass and prayed with my family mm -hmm. to you know another question of well, what what did you do well uh, you know we had some friends who they had a loss and so i went mm -hmm. to the wake and visited with them yeah. or you know, yeah. uh, I, I was, I, you know, we volunteered to help at the, the food pantry mm -hmm. or the soup kitchen yeah. or whatever, you know, those, mm -hmm. those, those very simple things that we do with a generous heart. Yep. Um, but again, deliberately doing them because of the relationship we have with Jesus mm -hmm. and being willing to share that, you know, yeah. 
to be able to say, I, you know, I went to be with this family because they're grieving the loss of grandma. Yeah. Um, and, and I believe Jesus gives us new life. And mm. so I, I felt it important just to be there with them, you know? I mean, how often is the case that people say, well, I don't know what to say in those situations, so I just don't want to put ourselves in our situ in that yeah, situation. Yeah, that you know, fear and, of discomfort. Yeah, yeah. you know, and, and mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's by stepping into those situations that quite that honestly, works. many times we feel like we're not going to be capable of dealing with it, and we walk away having been nourished and rich uh, because of it. You know, God works for both parties, iron sharpening iron right yeah, there. You know, you know uh, I, I think that the, the thought just occurred to me, we, a wonderful priest that uh, when I was a newly ordained priest, he was a, a retired priest uh, and, and that eventually he, um, he, I went to visit him when he was in the hospital. He had heart problems mm -hmm. near the end of his life. And Father Leo was always, he was in the military. He was a military chaplain for most of his priesthood. So everything was, mm -hmm orderly and everything sure, like that and, yeah. you know and so i came in to visit him uh you know in his hospital bed and and I, i'm thinking what can i offer this man who has spent almost 50 years as a priest and yeah. and that and and it was a very regimented visit you know <laughs> oh you're here you're busy we're going to do this and we're going to pray mm -hmm. and we're going to you know and, and uh you know it's just kind of i remember the experience very well because in the end you know, I walked out of the, the, the most important thing that happened in that encounter. Mm -hmm. This man I respect, you know, a great deal who, who gave me a great example as a young priest of, mm -hmm. you know, living for the people, living for the gospel. And that, you know, when I walked out of that room, the last thing that we said to each other, which was the most important thing was Leo said, I love you. And I turned around, I said, Leo, I love you. And I thank wow. you. You know, I mean, wow. that's the encounter. <laughs> That's the experience yeah. Yeah. that is so important that that our world hungers for, mm -hmm. um, and and you know when we put ourselves into those situations, even if we may judge ourselves to be incapable yeah. or not ready for them, oh, man, God does wonderful things and and makes of that that moment. Yep those powerful moments of evangelization that is and profound. encounter. And yeah, wow, what a cool story and. I heard a talk a while ago, I listened to it regularly of this priest who talks like Jesus will never work in fear and pressure, right? Like that's not how he works. And, and even in a sense, as you were speaking about that story, like, okay, I know this priest is pretty regimented. I know this is going to be how it goes when we get in there. And when you finally like let Jesus enter into there and say like, okay, let's be vulnerable with one another. Let's be real with one another. Then something powerful happened that, that fear. Jesus never works in fear. And sometimes when we, like a lot of us, especially those that maybe are more like, they, maybe they work for the church or they're involved in the church or whatever it is. They invite someone over to their house for dinner or whatever, and they're sitting there and they're starting to feel guilty as they're sitting there. I haven't talked about Jesus yet, you know? Like, and, and they're like, they feel that pressure of like, I should talk about Jesus. I should talk about like, I, I, I love this idea. Like in that moment, when you're feeling pressure to talk about Jesus, you shouldn't talk about Jesus, right? Like, don't do it then, because we're going to do it weird. We're going to do yeah. it in a way, because what we need to do in that moment, like when the pressure comes of feeling like I need to like, Jesus, there's some silly pressure in my heart right now to speak about you. I need you to enter right into that spot with me right now. And if you bring peace to that spot, then it's going to be time to talk to you. But if the pressure remains there, it's not going to be time to talk because it's going to come out weird, you know? Right. And, um, <laughs> well, it's got to be that authentic witness. Exactly. You know, because yeah. again, that authentic witness comes because we have been transformed mm -hmm. by our experience of Jesus in our, in our hearts, in our lives. You know, and it's, it's, it's something that, you know, as you talk about, it's, it's creating those moments mm -hmm. of uh, encounter, yeah. right? That, that's a big word in my mind, when we talk about evangelization, yeah. we talk about encounter. Mm -hmm. How do we encounter the presence of Jesus in, in our lives? And it's in our relationships again, which we've been talking about, but it, it's, it's not a forced or pressured type of a situation. Uh, there's, there's not going to be a score sheet that says, you know, you, you, you know, when you do Wordle, it, it tracks how many words you got right in, in a month, right? <laughs> you know, it's it, at the end of the month, it's not going to be, I evangelized 31 days in the month of October, 
you know, and I only evangelized 28 days in the month of September. Mm-hmm. You know, th- th- there's no like accounting going on. Sure. It, yeah. it, what What's going on is is that deepening awareness of our relationship and our, our ability and our desire to share that, which sometimes is going to be successful yep. and sometimes it's not. Yeah. Sometimes it's going to be awkward. Other times it's going to be very easy. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's going to bear fruit. Other times it's going to fall on the ground that doesn't allow the seed yep. to grow. Yep. You know, all of that is beyond us. Mm-hmm. What isn't beyond us is our desire and our willingness and our openness to be the evangelizer, yeah. to share the encounter that we have had, which is a calling for all of us. It's not just a calling for you as a priest or for me as a bishop or for a religious sister, or it, it's the baptismal calling. Yep. Every one of of every single one of us to be the instruments that the Lord uses mm-hmm. and that in being an instrument to others, others are instruments mm-hmm. to us that we receive that experience of Jesus in our lives and in our hearts in such a powerful way. It's like you, you said that a, a construction worker on a construction site who has just hasn't thought about Jesus in years and years and years, it's not going to be the priest or the bishop who goes and encounters the construction worker who has fallen. It's going to be a construction worker who lives, who works on that site with him, who has fallen in love with Jesus. Um, The lawyer in the lawyer's office or the nurse in the doctor's office, whatever, like like the bishop or the priest, maybe some strange instance where they'll be in that setting, but in all reality, where is that going to come from? A, like a nurse or a doctor in a doctor's office is going to encounter Jesus through another nurse or another doctor who's fallen in love with Jesus in that right. doctor's office or that construction site or whatever it is, that it has to be those people who has fallen in love with Jesus and always has to start with that us encountering him first, mm-hmm. like you said, and that being vulnerable with him in conversation. Um, then we learn to encounter and be vulnerable with other people and how we share that about how I've encountered him, become less and less afraid to do it, whether we're, whether we're the construction worker or the lawyer or the doctor or the nurse or whatever it is. And I, so we, we've said, like, I see that, like, man, there's so many cool things there. I talk about this to the end of time, you know, this right. is fun to talk about. Um, with all of that, like we've been talking all these relationships, we've been talking about all these things. Now with our with growing disciples and everything that's going on that, that you've been initiating that I'm super excited about and, and like this is what like would you want to say to me or to any person out there who's watching about all this stuff we've been talking about in evangelization? How does that fit into the vision of like what you're trying to do with our with growing disciples and what like and I mean I think it's somewhat we've said it but like mm-hmm. I don't know could you kind of help piece that together for me and for the people sure. who are watching um, the church has always faced challenges mm-hmm. um, in in every age since the church was created by Jesus Christ we've always had challenges to our witness of our faith mm-hmm. uh, and each successive generation. I mean, we're an apostolic church. We hand on what we have received. St. Paul writes eloquently about, I give you what I have first received. And that's what we're called to today. The reality is is, uh, that we live in a very different world uh, than the world was 25, 50 years ago, Mm -hmm. 100 years ago. And I often have had these conversations, especially when I, I was a priest in the parish, where parents and grandparents would lament the fact that my children or my grandchildren go don't go to mass. Sure. What did I do wrong is mm. often how they would, you know, phrase that question. And I would just say to them, did you live your faith? Did you witness to who you believe in Jesus? You took them to mass, you, you brought them to catechism classes. I mean, you did what you were supposed to do, right? Yeah. And, and in almost every case, the, the, the parent and the grandparent says, yeah, I did my best. Mm but they don't go to church. And I say, well, the, the issue is, is not that you failed, mm-hmm. that it's not your fault. It's that the world has changed so dramatically and drastically, yeah. Yeah. right? And so in our time, our, our opportunity, as well as our challenge, is to recognize how drastically the world has changed and there's values in the world that aren't con- in concert with what Jesus taught us. Yep. Um, and, and our task in growing disciples is recommitting ourselves 
to that original calling that Jesus gave to us to invite others into this relationship, right? So Jesus, before he ascended to heaven, says to the sent to his followers, go therefore and make disciples, teaching them to observe all that I have taught you, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So Jesus gives us a commission, a mission that from time to time in the life of the church, we have to, in a sense, course correct mm. um, because we get wrapped up in other things. Sure. And that's kind of what we're doing right now with Growing Disciples is, is looking and saying, in this time, mm. in our given time, yeah. how do we take up anew what Jesus told those first disciples? Yeah. Uh, how do we go out and, and share the transformative relationship that Jesus has given to us? because he loved us enough to come into our world to suffer and die on the cross and be raised from the dead to give us new life, new purpose, new meaning. And so growing disciples is really all about once again, tapping into the grace of the relationship we have with Jesus and being willing to make that a priority of who we are as a church, right? Because the church isn't a building. Church is the people of God. And, and, you know, we can get caught up in a building <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and lose sight of the relationship. Yeah. And so I believe what we're called to do in our generation at this point in the life of the church is to tap back into that, that first commission, that, that great commission of Jesus, recognizing how we are sent into the world that has lost for many factors beyond our control. Sure but has lost that sense of the need of the encounter with Jesus hmm. and then allowing that encounter to be transformative in, in people's lives. Uh, and so growing disciples is all about, you know, helping us to kind of recognize what we have been doing because we've been doing evangelization in many ways. Mm -hmm. We just haven't been talking about it, yeah, you know, yep. as a priority. Yep. Um, and in some cases we do need to lift it up as the priority. Sure. Um, it, but it's allowing us to kind of look at ourselves again and say, Jesus has changed my life. How can I bring that encounter to the world, mm. to, to the people that I encounter, right? You know, the good news is, is we don't have to save the world. That's been done. <laughs> Jesus did it for us. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Right? What we have to do is help remind the world that Jesus has saved us. Mm. Uh, and that's so important because in so many ways, again, for reasons beyond our control, uh, the world has forgotten that it needed a savior and that it got a savior in Jesus Christ. Mm. Uh, and so inviting people into that experience is what Growing Disciples is all about. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I think we often maybe when we reflect upon ourselves, even doing that examination of conscience that we often make each night, you know, we're looking and saying, did I do this? Did, you know, we, we, it's almost from a negative point of view, mm -hmm. right? I didn't do enough. We haven't done this right. Sure. We haven't got, you know, we, we, we haven't gotten it down the way it's supposed to, you know, my prayer life isn't the way it's supposed to, you know? So we, we often are kind of, in a sense, negative. Mm -hmm in that reflection of who we're called to be um, because we, we don't feel adequate <laughs> or equipped. And our task is to remind ourselves that we are adequate and we are equipped. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have to have a degree in theology to be an evangelizer. Yep. All we have to have is that encounter with Jesus that changed our hearts and our willingness to share it. Mm -hmm. We don't have to have a hundred programs or you know, have a, this is how it's got to be done, the, the how-to list of these are the 10 steps to yeah. successful evangelization. Yeah. All we have to have and use is the gift of the Holy Spirit that's been given to the church hmm. so that we can look at each situation as we go through our days yeah. and say, here's an opportunity for me to, to give witness, mm -hmm. to share my faith. Wow. Sometimes very publicly, mm -hmm. you know, but often very quietly. Sure. Sometimes, you know, uh, one of the things I know you've done at your parish is you've had some of the school kids give a witness talk and sure. that. Um, that's a, a, just a great example of how some evangelization can take, take place. 
So it might be very quote unquote formal in that mm -hmm. sense. But a lot of times it's going to be that conversation, sure. as you were pointing out, like, you know, mom and dad at the, the ball game, mm -hmm. the soccer field, yeah. or when we're at our work, you know, uh, and, and it doesn't have to be these overt like, hey, you've got to believe in Jesus, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's it's because uh, that that's often, you know, that that's often unsettling, awkward. Mm -hmm. And if anything, it, it creates disinterest. Sure. Yeah, it's it's got to be authentic. It's got to be it's got to be lived. Mm -hmm. It's got to be real, um, and, and and I think it's this is just one of those moments in in history in the history of the church, where we have to tap into that that experience of those first disciples, sure, who experienced Jesus, who said, "Come follow me," and they left mm -hmm. everything, yep. and followed him. Their hearts were set on fire, and and they went out to evangelize the world. Yep. you know, and and because they did. You and I are having this conversation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, if they hadn't done that, we wouldn't be talking about it. Yeah, we wouldn't be talking about our own experience of Jesus yeah. and our faith and giving witness to that. So, just kind of taking everything you're you're saying there and trying to synthesize that myself. Even you, you bring up some really important aspects of first. You called it the Great Commission, right? Like we need to remember, like you said that Jesus already saved us, right? Yeah. Like he already did what he needed to do. We just take part in that. We're in commission with the one who already did the job. Like we, like literally, we are on a commission with him. We can't lose, right? Like right. as long as we keep our eyes on him. And he's trying to show us some specific things in this time and place. We don't live in the third century. We don't live in the 15th century. We don't live in the middle ages as much as like history nerds like me. Oh, it'd be awesome to live in another time and be an evangelist in that time. That's not what God called me to. He also didn't call me to live in the year 3,447. He called me to live right here in 2022. And he's asking us to read what's going on in our world. Look at the signs of what's happening around you. Be open to what the Spirit is doing, a church that is ever ancient, a church that is ever new. And bringing all of that together with this, with what we're trying to do in evangelization of like read those signs and start reaching people where people can be reached in these times in 2022, knowing that, yes, we could look at all of the struggles of all of the challenges of our times and all of the difficulties, or even personally looking at ourselves and saying, I'll never be adequate enough. I'll never be holy enough. But like reaching right back into the grace of God and saying, no, I won't be holy enough on my own, but with you, right. powerful things can happen. And in turn, drawing other people into that instead of, yes, the numbers, we need to look at them. There can't be good news without the bad news, right? The bad news of like knowing all these difficult numbers of we don't have as many people in the pews or as many people as we once did, but we want to draw them back into mission by the encounter through evangelization. And I just like one last quick story on that of, I just think of, of, you know, like some, a parish nearby to us that, that closed down and was closed down a while back. And, and it was a difficult thing. Of course, that's heavy to walk through and no one wants to see those things happen. But I'm seeing some of those people from that parish now at St. Mary's in Pontiac. And I've heard them say to me, like, Father, it feels like I'm part of something that is alive, right? Yep. Like, and, and, yep. and like, I was like, yes, Jesus, like, this is what you are doing. This is where you are leading us in our times. And I, like, I'm inspired by them because they see it like that was hard. That was difficult, whatever it was, all these difficult things that have happened or do whatever. But if Jesus is at the center of it all, all of that's going to be okay, right? My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Whatever difficulties come our way, we'll be okay. Whatever joys come our way, thanks be to God, right? And I think that that is what, like, I heard from you as you were you were speaking. We're reading the signs of the times that we live in right now, not 500 years or even 50 years ago or 25, but right now in this time, Holy Spirit, what are you doing? And it seems my goodness, like evangelization needs to be a big part of that, that solving of like, how have I fallen in love with Jesus and how do I go share that story? Yep. Is that, is that kind of Absolutely. what um, you're, you're trying to like with growing disciples, what you're looking at and what you're, is that Absolutely. a decent synthesis of yes. what you're yeah, very doing? good. Um, you know, you could, you could be our <laughs> spokesperson now for growing disciples. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, it is, it, it, we have difficult decisions we're going to face mm -hmm. as a church. 
Um, and, and uh, you know, if we commit all of our resources to the ways of the past, we're not living up to our calling of mission today. Mm. And, and the hope is, is that by recapturing in our head, in our heart, what Jesus really wants of us, mm. what Jesus really wants of the church, um, that, that we can free ourselves up and be better evangelizers, that we can invite others more into the encounter uh, with him. Because I believe that if we get more people encountering Jesus in a very powerful, authentic, unique way in their own life, mm -hmm. if, they, if we are getting more people uh, intentionally looking and saying, Jesus loves me mm -hmm. for who I am and wants me to be a part of his, his life, his life is the church. His life is the body of Christ, right? The church, the people of God, you know? And so it's, it's, it, you gotta, it, again, you have to go through this experience of encounter with Jesus in a powerful way that sets you on fire, that leads you into the life of the, the community, the church. Mm -hmm. And, and this is, I believe our calling at this time, wow. you know, um, I can think back uh, I just went to my home parish that I grew up in for their legacy mass as they are three parishes becoming one parish mm -hmm. as they are three churches, three church buildings becoming one church building. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and as I mentioned to the people that I was there when I was with them, with them for mass is as important as this building was where I made my first reconciliation, my first communion, where I was confirmed, where I was an altar server, where I celebrated my first mass, mm -hmm. you know, hmm. all of that, as much as is, is the, the building itself meant something to me, yeah. the reality is, is it's the people who are in my life because of that building that helped me to encounter Jesus in a powerful way that I could respond to his calling to say, I want you to be a priest. Now I want you to be a bishop, you know? Uh, so wow, it, yeah. it's those people. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's those, again, it's, it goes back to that, that, that relationship. Um, and that's why it's hard because, you know, the buildings are important. Sure. They facilitate what we do. Mm -hmm. But if it's about the building, then, then we're going down the wrong path. Sure because it's really about the encounter with Jesus and the people of God who bring that encounter into reality in, mm -hmm. in our lives, in our hearts, yeah. um, that invite us to, to, to deepen that relationship uh -huh. and help us to grow. Wow. As you, as you said that, and just really, I, I was taken to all, like but throughout my life and, and even right here at St. Mary's and where I'm at now, just seeing these instances of those people who are who are living who are going out and doing that I, I just i don't know it's so there's so many profound things just come into my head as you say that of like how god is already doing that we just have to be intentional about recognizing that and seeing that of you brought up some of the things like what we started doing at our church is having each of the staff get in front of the school at the school, end of the school mass and sharing a holy moment of like, it could be as simple as what happened yesterday. Like sure. this is what happened to me yesterday and God was present there in the little tiny thing that happened yesterday. And I, like, and our teachers were like a little at first, like really father, you want us yeah. to do this? And, and, and there, there, there's a hesitation there, but once they get up there, there has, Every time a different teacher gets up there, I'm just sitting at the end of mass watching them give this witness. It brings tears to my eyes. I'm just sure. like, Lord, look at what you are doing, you know, and, and all these, and like, let's share it, you know, like, and, and what happens in that process. Now I'm seeing as the teachers are showing the children, like what it means to encounter Jesus, something that I say, even in my heart, like, I never knew that was something I didn't see when I was growing up in Catholic school, but now I'm looking at it, I'm like, that's what my heart was longing for when I was in a school and the kids are seeing it. And now the kids like have asked, like, can we give witness talks? I'm like, yes, like, that's it. Like that's evangelization. Right. That's forming the sign. Like, and I didn't even do anything. All I did is just say like, 
hey, can we get up and share a talk about, like, I'll do it once in a while, you do it once in a while, get up and share, like, some small thing of how God has worked in our life, even just today. And when we pray, He shows that to us and He mm. reveals, like, look at this cool stuff that I'm doing. All we got to do is tell people about the cool stuff God's doing and they're going to fall exactly. in love. And that's, I, I like, yeah. And it's creating those moments. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I'm thinking back as I was listening to you, <clears throat> I was at a parish recently and, um, you know, as we were standing with the uh, five altar servers getting ready um, mm-hmm. just before Mass, the pastor said, you know, Bishop, one of the things we like to do here is uh, we like to share what we're going to pray for, mm-hmm. what the intentions are. Uh, that are on our hearts as we're getting ready to celebrate this Mass. Mm -hmm. And so he called each of the five kids who were were servers, and they each talked about different things Mm -hmm. that were in their mind and in their heart that they wanted to bring to the Lord during that Mass. Mm -hmm. It was very powerful, and it was really wonderful, you know, because it was just simply, I'm sharing what's on my heart. And and, and, and part of that is, I'm giving my authentic witness. Mm -hmm. I'm giving my witness that I think that if we bring Jesus to this situation or that situation or this moment, transformation can happen. Amen. You know, and, and we we tend to be uh, a little, you know, uh, uh, reserved. Again, I'm going back earlier. We're talking about fears and mm-hmm. and that. I mean, we 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 tend to not want to put ourselves out there, mm-hmm. you know, uh, because again. We're, what's what's going to happen, <laughs> you know? And, and and I assure you, what happens is is if we put ourselves out there for Jesus, good things happen. Mm-hmm. It's when we don't put ourselves out there for Jesus that we're held back, and the world is held back. Mm-hmm. We don't have those encounters for ourselves and for others that lead us to the deeper relationship, the deeper mo- deeper moments of prayer, you know. And again. I think it's it it it's happened. It's happened in all of our lives. Mm-hmm. It's happened in my life. Did I have this language to talk about it when I was an awkward teenager? Absolutely not. Sure. You know, I went to the teen club because my mother forced me to go to the teen club. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it, 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 but the things that I experienced there, again, going back to just being there for the legacy mass at Saint Joe's Parish, some of the people I saw were people who were the leaders, the adult leaders when I was the teenager in that group and that they gave me authentic witness of their love for Jesus and their love for, for me, you know, as a young boy growing up and that, and, and so I didn't have the language to talk about it then as I talk about it today. Um, I didn't have an understanding of my calling then as I understand my calling today. You know, the wonderful thing is, is the Lord just keeps working with us and on us (laughs) So that we can grow in this and deepen this re- encounter in this relationship so that we can learn the language. And I think, again, this is kind of our task in, in, in the life of the church today is to help people hear and learn the language of who they already are yeah, yeah. <laughs> and who they're called to be for, for Jesus. And that's, that's our task in, in the moment is to help people to say, I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. Right? I mean, I believe the Catholic Church is essential. <laughs> it's Jesus' church. Yep. You know, but Jesus didn't say, go make Catholics. He said, go make disciples. And disciples will be nurtured and nourished and fed and give witness in his church, mm-hmm. the Catholic Church. Mm-hmm. But it starts with that understanding and giving that understanding to myself and to, to those that I'm privileged to encounter mm-hmm. and to learn from their encounter, those encounters of who Jesus wants us to be um, and who calls us to be and, and that and give us the language, you know, that we we tend not to talk. We we started this whole th- conversation about evangelization being the big scary word that the church uses to just simply say, I'm going to live out my faith and give authentic witness to my my experience of Jesus's love that has transformed who I am. You know, that's evangelization. Very simple. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it doesn't happen necessarily happen in these most grandiose and and powerful ways i mean it's always a powerful way but it it doesn't have to be this big public spectacle in a sense it's the one-on-one encounter when i take time to pray when i take time to really love another person 
to want the best for you, uh, to want to see you grow and deepen that 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 relationship that's so important to to both of us. Yeah. You know, I, that's it's it's it, it's 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 those personal engagements, encounters that that going back to the story of Moses, the two disciples are walking on the road and Jesus walks with them. He comes into their midst. Yeah. You know, that's that's a paradigm. Hmm. If we walk together, the Lord walks with us. Wow, that's good stuff. <laughs> and um, and uh, yeah, my I suppose I'll just share this last scripture and then I like, because what you said there made me think it's my favorite line in all of scripture. It's First Peter 3, 15, like Peter who has encountered Jesus Christ deeply and profoundly is saying, always be prepared to make an account for the hope that is in you, but do it with gentleness and reverence, right? Like that, if I were to put a word, a phrase into everything we've talked about, mm -hmm. that's it, right? Like to always be prepared yeah. to, to have an account for the hope that is in us, whether it's in a one-on-one -on -one setting, uh, a big group setting, whatever that is, that we would be intentional about always having that because the hope is there. It's him, right? Um, it's always there. And that's, where it comes from, always remembering that we do it with gentleness and reverence and, and leading people in whatever way the Spirit's leading them in that moment. And that's kind of what I heard you saying as you kind of gave all of this evangelization, how it fits with growing disciples and what we're trying to do in our diocese. And that has me pretty excited to go back out to the parish and go do some pretty cool things with God's grace. So um, thanks for sharing all that. Well, thank you for being part of the conversation today. Absolutely.